the beginning of summer in America, a time for reflection on the price of freedom, and a time for celebrating traditions, including the American motorsports tradition of oval racing. Round four of the PPG Car World Series at Nazareth Speedway saw hometown favorite Michael Andretti charge from a lap down to within inches of race leader Paul Tracy. But Andretti could not find a way by, and Tracy's win ended a 20-race winless stretch for Team Penske. Two weeks later and 5,000 miles away in Rio de Janeiro, Bobby Rahal had the lead with Tracy close behind and a fuel gauge ticking away. When it reached zero with just two laps to go, the three-time champion slowed, and Tracy swept past for his second win in a row. Today, across the Mississippi River from St. Louis, in the shadow of the Gateway Arch, the fastest drivers in the world renew the great American tradition. The green flag has been thrown on the racing summer of 1997 and we're just moments away from doing the same on round six of the PPG Card World Series for 1997. Welcome to the inaugural running of the Motorola 300 at the all-new Gateway International Raceway in Madison, Illinois. Let's get quickly down to the starting grid and Jan Vikas. Well, Bob, certainly the man with the momentum coming into this race is Paul Tracy, having won the last two races. But in qualifying here, as he sits on the outside of row one, he pulled over five Gs around the corners. The team has now changed the steering rack in this car so that he's able to turn the car. The steering is so heavy. It's going to be brutal. It's going to be physical. Paul Tracy is ready. Let's go to Marty Reed. The other key player in that scenario at Rio, that man, Bobby Rahal. They think they're dialed in. They went 95 laps on a set of tires this morning. That's why they were very slow in the morning warm-up. They're very confident. And his partner, David Letterman, is here. And you have to remember that when Letterman has been here, Rahal has been on the podium two of the last three times. Wow! All right, thanks, guys. Let us say hello. I'm Bob Barsha, along with former car champion Danny Sullivan. And our thanks to David Letterman and Regis Philbin for getting our Memorial Day weekend off to a happy start. Danny, this racetrack is brand new, completely untested by the teams until they got here, but they've been working the groove in all of the practice sessions. Well, they've been trying to get it to work up to two lanes so that they can pass around the outside. That's going to be very tough. They're going to have to be patient. It's going to be tough. Traffic is going to be a big factor today. And pit lane is very long. A team can really help their drivers in the pits. Well, that pit lane is so long, it can take about 50 seconds by the time they come off to get back out there. That's two laps. They've got to be very quick, and the pits can lose or gain you some spots. The place is a complete sellout, 45,000. Motorola 300 underway. Stay with us. ESPN Speed World coverage of the Motorola 300 is being brought to you by Brewery Fresh Budweiser, who reminds you that fresh beer tastes better. By Robert Bosch Corporation, makers of Bosch Platinum, the ultimate spark plug. By Ford and your Ford dealer. Have you driven a Ford lately? And by Valvoline Duraplant, the number one selling semi-synthetic motor oil. Back at Gateway International Raceway where the teams are lined up on the grid and the crowd in the grandstand is on its feet in anticipation of the inaugural Motorola 300. Now let's join in saluting our country with the playing of the national anthem. We wish you a safe and reflective Memorial Day weekend, and we kick it off here 
at Gateway International Raceway. A huge crowd on hand at this brand new racing facility, and it is a very different kind of racetrack, Danny. Well, it is. Uh, long straightaways, about 2,000 feet on each one of them. A tight corner is in turn one and two, as you can see. The turns three and four, which are non-degree, which they think are a little quicker. The amazing part is during qualifying, they were doing 197 miles an hour in turns nine and three. That was their average from going into three and coming off of four. But uh, only one real good braking and passing spot that's going into one and two. Paul Tracy averaged 188 miles an hour for a complete lap in practice. That was about the quickest we saw. Tremendous speed on this racetrack and tremendous lateral G-forces, particularly in turns three and four, over five. And that is a lot of work for the drivers next. As you see, final pre-race preparations going on down on the grid. We are just moments away from the command to start engines. An enthusiastic crowd here in St. Louis, where the racing traditions run deep and wide. 236 laps of racing ahead. Now we have a high cloud cover overhead. There were reports of scattered showers expected late in the day. We hope to get this race completed. At 119 laps, we will have an official race should the raindrops come. So all of the teams up and down the pit lane will have one eye on the sky and the other on the fuel meters as they try to plan their pit stop strategy. Now let's get the command from Mr. Bob Growney, President and CEO of Motorola. Gentlemen, start your engines. This is when they're really, all the adrenaline's flowing right now. And this is, uh, once they get rolling a little bit, then it, it tends to settle down. But right at this moment. So final minutes before battle. There is Greg Moore, the Canadian. Very quick in the morning warm-up. He could well be a factor in today's race. Right now, let's take a look at the starting lineup for the inaugural Motorola 300. On the pole for the third time in his career, but the first since the Milwaukee Oval in 1994, Raul Boisel of Brazil, starting alongside Paul Tracy, winner of the last two races. He is also the championship leader coming into the weekend. Row two will be Mauricio Guzman, the Rio pole sitter, has had a second place finish this year at Long Beach. He'll be alongside the man I just mentioned, Greg Moore, two times this year. He's been second, including our last race on the Oval at Rio de Janeiro. Row three, Patrick Carpentier, in his sixth start in the series, two three top ten finishes. Row four will be Parker Johnstone, looking for consistency. He's only had two top tens this year. Next to Dario Franchitti, tied with Carpentier in the Rookie of the Year standings. Row five will be Jimmy Vassar, the defending series champion, whose last win came one year ago this weekend in the U.S. 500. Next to him, teammate Alex Zanardi. His only win this year came on the streets of Long Beach, California. Row six will be Michael Andretti, making his 200th start in a PPG car World Series IndyCar next to Bobby Rahal, who ran out of fuel while leading at Rio with just over two miles to go. A great story. Row 7, Richie Hearn, the fastest of the Lola qualified chassis. He'll be next to Brian Herta, who has had winner will have his work cut out for him starting 15th. He'll be next to countryman Roberto Moreno, who qualified on the front row at Rio and ran a strong second until tangling with another car. Row 9 will be Scott Pruitt, teammate to the pole sitter. Scott won earlier this year on the streets of Surfers Paradise, Australia. Next to him, Adrian Fernandez, who's in his backup car after a fire in the morning warm-up. Row 10 will be Andre Ribeiro. All three of his career wins have come on ovals. Next to him, Mark Blundell, whose sponsor, Motorola, is also the sponsor driver who moved to a backup after problems in the warm-up. Row 12, Juan Fangio II still looking to finish his first race since the season opener. He'll be next to Michelle Jourdain Jr., the youngest driver in the field. On row 13, P.J. Jones still looking to get a good performance out of the Toyota engine. And Hiro Matsushita, who had no time in qualifying, makes his 102nd career series start today. Now here are the stories we'll be following as the race just begins to unfold. Where's the groove? Brand new racetrack. We've had 
Guys down low, guys up high in the morning warm-up, trying to clean off the racetrack and see where they can pass. Traffic will be the story of the day for those who cannot pass. Pit strategy will be critical. We expect four pit stops, the first coming perhaps between laps 44 and 47, depending on yellow flags. <laughs> Let's get physical. A very tough racetrack on the drivers, particularly their necks and shoulders. And then there is the question of weather. As I mentioned, the forecast calls for scattered rain. See how far we get. Hopefully, we will go 236 laps. A look at the championship standings coming in. Paul Tracy with two straight victories. After five rounds, he leads by four points over Scott Pruitt, Alex Zanardi in third, followed by Michael Andretti, Greg Moore, and Jimmy Vassar. Good view from high over the head of the packed house here at Gateway as we get set to go racing down to Marty Reed. Weather could be a factor. We talked about it, but so far, Bob, things are looking good. In fact, give you an idea, there's a plane pulling one of those banners way up there. He's about 1,500 feet, and the cloud cover is extremely high. And the big key will be, if those clouds start to come lower, that's when it... You talk about those clouds, you talk about the temperature. Obviously, those clouds make it cooler on the racetrack, and therefore, the air going into the engines possibly could give you better fuel economy. So, it's going to be a four-stop race. If we have a lot of green, maybe these clouds could make it a three-stop run. All right, thank you, guys. There you see the cars warming tires and engines. Two laps to our green flag. You're on board with Bobby Rahal. What a story this team was in Rio. 70 races since the three-time series champion last one race. Looked like he had Rio in the bag, but they gambled on fuel and lost. And there's Michael Andretti. Engine a little bit there, Danny. Well, he's just accelerating forward, heating up those back tires, touching the brakes, probably getting them warmed up as well because of the dive into the first corner. You are down in turns three and four. Driving the pace car today, Walter Payton, NFL great Hall of Famer and co-owner of Payton Coin Racing. You can bet he feels the need for speed here today. Here's our Dodge Ram pickup pace car today. Raul Boisel on pole, Paul Tracy next to him. This could be an interesting first turn. The crowd on its feet saluting the drivers as the field makes its way around. And they will form up two by two very early on this lap before taking the green. Now, if you were with us for the Rio 400, you know that we had an incident just before the green flag. There's been a lot of talk about that. A lot of the drivers embarrassed. Questions about their professionalism. They've talked it out among them. And they are looking for a clean start here today at Gateway International Raceway. Half a lap to go. in three and four coming up to speed Boisel and Tracy on the front row the crowd is on its feet and cheering the field is off turn four headed for the green flag and we're underway the particles you see in the air are dust off the wheels of Raul Boisel who was down low lime was used to help cure this racetrack and there are deposits of it around the track that get kicked up by the wheels of the cars
Casey, who in turn has a big lead over Greg Moore, the blue car in third. Right behind Moore is Alenzer Jr. Alex Zanardi has gone from 10th at the start up to 6th, and Max Pappas pulls into the pit lane. Could there be more engine problems for the RCRO Wells team? They lost an engine in the warm-up this morning. They actually lost two. They had one go in their spare car on the last lap, and they had to change a motor to get him back out there. So, uh, the learning curve remains steep for Toyota in the PPG Kart World Series. There is Greg Moore running third, behind him, Allenzer Jr. in fourth. We've watched him all week long. He can run up there high. He's the one pushing the groove up. Seems to run up very close to that wall. And, uh, we asked him about it yesterday. He doesn't think he's that close. And we could have sworn he actually touched it. With Alex Zanardi and Patrick Carpentier just behind him. A train down the back stretch. schedule of this 1.27 mile oval and of course if it stays green like this for for a period of time expect the pit stops about lap 44 someplace in the window 44 to 47 maybe even all the way to 50 depending on what kind of mileage they're getting there goes jimmy vassar going down the inside of parker johnstone vassar. well we've seen the most moves that appears by those two guys Down in turn one, Roberto Moreno in the Newman Haas Budweiser sponsored car is up high on the racetrack. Mechanical problems, could not pull down low, might have been dicing with other cars at the time. The engine appears to be silent. Doesn't appear to be any damage on that car. I'd imagine just in a safety issue, he pulled up there because he couldn't get down to the inside of the track in a safe manner and keep away from the other cars, so he just stayed up there. The yellow flag is out. The safety car will be on the track to get the field under control. While we have a moment, we'll take a quick time out and return for more live from Gateway International Raceway. This is the Motorola 300. Allen Jr. has come into the pitch because on the rear wing, there was a piece coming off the rear wing. Now, on an oval, you are not allowed to run what's known as a wicker bill. So therefore, if the wing is built with one, you have to put in a spacer to take that away. Well, that particular spacer was starting to come off of the car so they the word on Roberto Moreno is that this gearbox he has got fifth gear but he can't get it to go forward and it may also be a combination of problems as the oil pressure as well so they're trying to diagnose this thing see if they can get him back in get him back out on the track all right thank you gentlemen Raul Boisel remains the race leader Paul Tracy just behind him as we remain under caution, Jan Vikas. Well, to further up update you on the other Penske runner, of course, Paul Tracy, he feels that he ran over some debris. He says the crew, can you please check the car? I think I ran over a helmet pad coming out of someone else's car. Paul Tracy comes back up to speed in second place, but from behind, Alex Zanardi goes underneath Mauricio Gugelman for fourth place. The order is Boisel, Tracy, Moore, Gu uh, Zanardi, Gugelman, Carpentier, Vassar, Johnstone, Franchitti, and Alonzer Jr. rounds out the top ten after the pit stop. He and Jimmy Vassar's car seem to be working very well off the four. They're both making passes. On to the back stretch. Off of turn two. Up to about 190 miles an hour and no lifting down into three and four. You ride with Alex Zanardi. Zanardi was going down a gear in practice. There he is. Of course, what that does is that when, he, when the RPMs go down to one, it gives him a good pull off of two down that back straightaway. Carry a little bit more speed down in there. You heard him grab six. No break in the RPM at all. Well, it's a lot easier to do 
that because with the sequential gearboxes and the electronics, they can just shift and they never take their foot off of the throttle. They just hold it all the way on the floor and the electronics help the turbo slow down and shift the car. Let's go back to the next car in line now. His teammate, Jimmy Vassar. Big jolt right there. That's that one bump right there in turn four. Gives him a jolt, but nobody seems to be real upset about it. Now we'll look from high overhead at the two target team Ganassi teammates. Zanardi is third and Vassar sixth in the championship coming into this weekend. And thus far, if we were worried about the racing groove, Danny, it appears to be wide enough for two cars. We're getting some good side-by-side -side racing. Well, we are, but we haven't seen really the, the leaders yet on, on the on slower cars or the back mark when they're going to have to go up there and go around them on, on the outside. Most of the passes that we've seen are going into turn one under braking. Battle going on between Carpatier and Franchitti. They are tied for the lead in the Jim Truman Rookie of the Year stand. First, talk to Pat Patrick. He loves the race pace that Raul Boisel is running right now. And as far as uh, Mike Wandretti, he hasn't made any move forward, but he, we were listening in, and he said, looks like Ray Hall's really loose, so keep an eye out for that battle to brew up as well. Also, it is a combination of problems on Moreno. It was a gearbox, as well as he just lost oil pressure at the same time he lost high gear. We're also starting to get into some slower cars right now. Saw Greg Moore take a move around the outside. Look at that. There's a... Uh, Of course, Frankini's hoping that they do something so he can take advantage of them. They slow down and he can make a run. And Carpatier got out of the toe, took a look underneath, and then slowed dramatically. That's a tough end. Third car right there, the black and silver car. Hogan on the side. Call it the home team, if you like. Carl Hogan, the car owner, is based here. His trucking this, empire based in St. Louis. This is going to be tricky. Now, there's a back marker right there at the left of your screen. Looks like it's Hero very carefully around the outside of them. That helps because eventually it just keeps the groove up. Next time he does it, he'll be a little quicker around it. Cars laying down rubber for these tires all weekend long, adding to the traction. Here's Al Unzer Jr. trying to move up on Parker Johnstone. Unzer Jr. is eighth, and Johnstone presently shown in 17th place. So he has dropped a lot of ground. on the rear wing, which effectively gave him a little bit of a wicker at the back of the car. They have shown the cart officials their spare wing, and cart says, what a Greg Moore. He is, in fact, Greg Moore is going under Allenzer Jr. for the spot. I hate to correct you, but that's Paul Tracy. Excuse that, me. That is Paul Tracy for second spot. We were just on that other battle, and we switched over to that. Just ahead of Raul Boisel as they begin to lap 
slower traffic. Wazell's an interesting story. Here's a guy, world sports car champion, Formula One experience, Greg Moore coming up around the outside. Slower traffic ahead. Nope. But Wazell, to finish my story, has shown on the short ovals here in North America running the PPG Car World Series. Two poles on the oval at Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where we'll be next week. Jan Vikas. Well, talking about Greg Moore, we checked with the team and they said that we're not speeding up. We think everyone else is dropping into our clutches. Right now, they're happy with their pace as there's a yellow on the course. The note of the engines comes down as the yellow flag comes on and the lights flash all the way around the circuit to warn the drivers. I'll tell you what, Raul was thankful for that, for that yellow. The Motorola Pack West Reynard take this opportunity for a timeout. Yellow flag, our second of the day. The pits are now closed, so the cars will stay on the track. That explains why Blondell didn't go for it. I couldn't see the sign. From clear that the lapped cars will be allowed to come down. And the teams will get their first opportunity to help their drivers Move up the line under caution. Decide to change because they're losing. Put a little bit more pressure, take a little bit out to give them a little bit more. Racy, Zanardi. Just behind Zanardi is Dario Franchini, Parker Johnstone, and Al Unser Jr. While we have the field slowed down, we'll take a Live, the Motorola 300. Let's get down to Jan Vikas. In the you saw how fast he was running. The crew made no changes on that car, but unfortunately, it came up off the air jacks. They had a problem with the right front. It came down back up. Those cars that stayed out on the track was race leader Raul Boisel. Scott Pruitt, his teammate Pitt. He, that was the strategy that they want to run here on the Brahma team because that now covers their bases. It's called the split team strategy. They're looking for a number of laps for a splash at the end. And in fact, if we get about 36 laps of yellow total, you might see some of these teams try and gamble for a three-stop race instead of four. So that's the strategy right now. Boisel stays out because that covers both bases. There are a lot of very short fingernails up and down the pit lane as these guys work on those fuel calculations. There is Raul Boisel, who, as mentioned, did not pit. Coming around to complete lap 35, and we anticipate the green flag when we do. Boisel, Tracy, the third car in line. Green flag, green flag. The spotters on the radios telling their drivers it is green. Hammer down. We have spotters high overhead on the ovals of PPG Cup competition. Working the traffic, Moselle, Tracy, Carpentier, Franchitti, Zanardi, the top five. Boy, that's when you hold your breath up there when you got to go around the outside and you're not sure about that groove. It looks slippery up there. It probably is a little slippery. Looking incredibly strong here in the early laps of this race. Just driving away from Paul Tracy. Don't forget, he's fairly light on fuel. Greg Moore's back there with a new set of tires, full load of fuel. He'll be a factor at some stage again. Further back, Dario Franchitti on the left in fourth place. Alex, uh, excuse me, uh, Patrick Carpentier on the left in two almost identical looking cars. Dario Franchitti, the second car in line. As Carpentier ducks to the inside to go around traffic. And of course, this is a pretty fierce battle because these are two rookies. They've got another little championship or a side bet going right now. Franchitti ducks out from behind. Dan Gurney's All-American Racers machine, still working with the Toyota engine, still needing horsepower. Now 
the two Ganassi teammates, Zanardi and Vassar. And once again, the yellow flag flies from the flag stand, and there is the reason. That is Juan Fangio, the second. That could not all be lime dust. He apparently has lost another engine. He is on the start-finish straightaway, just across the wall from the pits right in front of a massive grandstand with 45,000 fans, and look at the smoke from that engine. I don't see any visible sign of oil down on the track. The cart safety team is right there. We'll have a quick look around the car, make sure nothing's burning. The pace car slash truck is coming <laughs> down there on the inside. Trying to get by, trying to get around there to get in the front of those cars. Safety truck being driven by Gail Truis, the PPG pace car team. Once again, the sign is up, the pits are closed. We'll see if Raul Boisel comes in this time around. 40 laps complete, working 41 of 236. in the line have not pitted. Boisel, Tracy, Carpentier, and Franchitti. Most of the rest of the field has pitted at least once. Allenzer Jr. has pitted twice. On the right is Fangio's stricken car. In the last safety truck you saw there line he's looking for oil on the track just to make sure it's clean there's no oil in the racing line Jan Beek is down in the pit lane has more on Alan Jr.'s situation yes we do when Alan Jr. came in to make his pit stop they made a tire change they qualified on the softer Goodyears. Now they have put the harder Goodyears on the outside of Allinger Jr.'s car. The idea being that the tires are just a little bit slower, but they're much better on a longer run. So obviously they're hoping there are longer runs. This yellow doesn't really play into their strategy. But what we're also seeing here, which is very typical of Roger Penske, they're doing a little bit experimenting in the early stages of the race to figure out what they want to do at the end of the race when they're going to be uh, hopefully still on the lead lap and then they'll make their call. Now from high overhead, you see the pace truck leading the field around and the cars on the pace, on the inroad to the pits have to be very careful that they maintain that same pace. You cannot go quicker than the cars behind the pace truck. Marty Reed is down in the pits. Yeah, we're waiting for Raul Boisel. Now they are going to make a change also in tires. They feel like they need a little bit more compound. They're going to go from the option to the primary and that that will probably be the only change because they are extremely happy with the car. Uh, obviously, we really didn't get a real long run on any of these tires. What's coming off looks very fine, but uh, wow, they got that fuel in. He is back out on track. And it is critical that you get the car stopped and started again as quickly as possible as Patrick Carpentier and his rookie rival Dario Franchitti come out together. There's a little bit of rookie enthusiasm. <laughs> There isn't enough room for two cars in the acceleration lane. They are back out now, and Carpentier comes out where he went in ahead of his rookie rival, Franchitti. He ride with Michael Andretti. Boy, that got a rise out of this <laughs> packed house. And on the nose of Bobby Rahal's machine, here's Alex Zanardi. We'll be back in a moment. about one lap from green here at Gateway International Raceway. Let's get down to Jan Bikas. Well, Alan Sir Jr. has had some bad news. Roger Penske talking to some of the card officials. The last time he left the pits, he did not blend properly. In other words, he did not take the spot that he should have on the racetrack. They have now put him at the back of the field. There you see him. Just behind Michel Jourdain and Hiro Matsushita. The car is coming up to speed now. We anticipate a green flag. How will Alan Sir Jr. handle We'll see in a moment. His teammate, Paul Tracy, is in the lead as we go green on lap number 47. The order is Tracy, Alex Zanardi, Jimmy Vassar, Greg Moore, Mauricio Gugelman, 
Parker Johnstone, Scott Pruitt, Bobby Ray Hall, Brian Herta, Michael Andretti, Jill DeFerrin, Andre Rivero, Adrian Fernandez, Walter Salas, Raul Boisel, who started the race from pole, now back in 15th, followed by Patrick Carpentier, Dario Franchitti, and Al Unzer Jr. that turn flat 71 races since the three-time series champion has won mashing down the back stretch of course that car you see right there behind paul tracy is richie hearn who's a lap down in that 19th spot but uh, he doesn't look like he's losing any ground so he's obviously uh, hooked up and working well. Probably got out of step in those uh, pit stops. John Delapana, the car owner and chief engineer on that car. They are usually very quick. The quickest of the Lola runners. The problems here today. This is Jimmy Basser. Raul well, Boisel has led the bulk of the laps. 41 to 8 for Paul Tracy. Basser with Greg Moore just behind him. said it before things happen quickly on a short track see how greg can get up there in that higher lane just a little bit higher looks like he's carrying a little bit more speed Ooh. oh he's gonna have a look but uh, jimmy said uh, no thank you i'm not giving up that spot speaking of looks there's a great one yeah. see how he's just at about a half a car higher on there he's trying to move that groove up a little bit and obviously his car works well see how he's out there a little higher a little bit higher. Bass are able to pull a car length or two on more on the straightaway. Jan Bika says more. Yes, down the pit lane, there is some discussion in the team target uh, crew here that Jimmy Vassar may have a tire going down. Now, I asked the crew, do they have the tire pressure indicators of the telemetry that some of the other teams do? They say no. So they have to rely on Jimmy Vassar's seat of the pants feel. They're not sure if he's losing air pressure, but they're ready for a pit stop just in case. Vassar looked under Hiro Matsushita, thought better of it. Vassar as the two of them pull out from behind Matsushita. Vassar in red, more in blue. Well, if Jimmy's got a tire going down, he's certainly not slowing up for it. And, uh, that's a tough decision because you're trying to think about it. The last thing you need is for it to go down rapidly that'll cause a big incident. Here are the gaps over the last three laps between these two. Constantly coming down. This is the back stretch. 1,976 feet long before you dive into three. And remember, these guys pitted, I believe, at the same time. They have a similar fuel load, the same number of laps on the tires. Turns one and two. You can tell by the way Vassar comes out of the throttle. Four cars officially out of the race at this point. The leader is 29 miles an hour. Here's the running order with the gaps behind the leader. Four once again right up on Vassar's rear wing. You see Vassar's progress through the race thus far. He's around to complete lap number 57 next time by. from him trying to get a little draft down that straightaway it's about 2,000 feet of straightaway trying to get the car in front of him to make a hole in the air and pull him down there a little bit and then slingshot out and try to dive underneath him for braking you see the last lap speeds through different segments of the racetrack look at this he's closing on it. he's going to go that's right off of four Takes third place away from Jimmy Vassar. You saw the rear wing, the 
those little vortexes as the moisture is squeezed out of the air over the over the wing which tells me at least that Moore is carrying perhaps a little more wing than Vassar which is why he was having trouble getting him on the straightaways well he certainly got through three and four so fast that time he pulled out right when he came off of four so he had a tremendous run on him word from Vassar's fit is he has said no more about the possibility of the tire going down now here's Parker Johnstone in sixth place Scott Pruitt just behind him in seventh up and get a piece of this fight. Scott Pruitt, second in the championship by four points to Paul Tracy coming into this weekend. There is your leader, Paul Tracy, with a gap of about 3.8 seconds over the second place car of Alex Zanardi. fifth race that Paul Tracy has led this year. Going into today's race, he had led over 40% of the total laps run thus far. We'll be back with more from Gateway Live in just a moment. Race leader, but that was two leaders ago. That's how quickly things are happening here. Moments after we went to commercial, Paul Tracy came into the pit lane. He was slowing noticeably on the track. And he came down, and then that put Alex Zanardi in the lead before Greg Moore came calling off of turn four, Danny. Yes, I think he did. he sized him up for one or two laps, and then he just really laid back going into three and stood on it, got a run on him, and right coming off of four, just like he did to Jimmy Vassar, he pulled out and passed. For the first time since the Michigan 500, 10 races ago, Greg Moore and Forsyth Racing are in the lead as he looks underneath Richie Hearn. Let's get down to Jan Bikas now and find out what happened to Paul Tracy. Yes, Paul Tracy came in. You said he slowed a little bit on the racetrack. That was just so that he could get positioned to get into pit lane. He said the car was getting loose, so they decided to come in at the early part of the window. They made an 11.7 second stop. They took some front wing out of it, so Paul should be happier by now. He may well be happier, but he dropped from the race lead down to 19th place with that green flag stop. Yeah, he went a couple of laps where he was slow, and that car must have gotten really loose. And I would imagine what they told him was stay out two more laps or something so we can get inside of a window for the fuel, and uh, then you can stop. In fact, the man who was hounding Paul Tracy during that lap before he pitted was the man right there in the red and white car with the yellow helmet, Richie Hearn under and thinks better of it. Yeah, Richie's pretty racy and he's a ways back, but uh, he certainly has a quick car. All of the top cars have pitted once, except Alonzo Jr. back in 15th, who was pitted twice after that problem with loose part on the wing. Roberto Moreno is one of the cars out of the race, and Marty Reed is with him. Yeah, you never like to talk to guys before the checkered flag falls. Roberto, we had several reports, but it turned out to be you lost all the oil pressure. Uh, re not really, the engine it was okay. We uh, got the gearbox seizing up and it eventually blew up. Uh, it was unfortunate, short race for the Kmart Budweiser team, but uh, we'll be back strong again next weekend in Milwaukee. Let's talk a little bit about the G loading, the number of laps that you were out there. How we've, we, we've been speculating how physical this event will be. How physical is it out there? Um, basically, it's all lateral Gs. You get up to five Gs lateral. But we are all protected for it, um, and it doesn't bother us too much once you get used to it. Uh, it's just, it just feels like a weekend drive. We've got a caution on the track, guys. We do indeed. Something strange is happening here. Brian Herta pulled to a stop, leapt from his car, and just ahead of him, Raul Boisel is also rolling to a stop. Well, I, I would imagine if Brian jumped out of that car, he had some hot fluids or maybe even a fire, but some more than likely hot water rolling down there around his uh, rear end, and he wanted to get out of it. You can see the steam coming out of the cockpit as Brian Herta trots back to the pits. I wasn't looking up the racetrack. I'm not sure if that is related to Raul Boisel's problem. We're going to take a deep breath and find out what's going on as Herta heads back to the pits to tell the team what happened. 
Up front, Greg Moore remains the leader. There has hurt his car with those fluids coming out the bottom. We'll take a break after this message and a word from our ABC stations. Gateway International Raceway and the Motorola 300. Our aerial shots are being provided by the Bud One Airship, which reminds you, fresh beer tastes better. Against that cool gray sky, we have an interesting story developing here at the Motorola 300. There you see Brian Herta's stricken car being towed off after he had what appeared to be a hot water leak in the cockpit. At the same time, Raul Boisel, who started from pole and led the first 41 laps of this race, also came to a stop. Let's get down to Jan Bikas, who's with Brian Herta. Well, let's find out about Brian Herta. You jumped out of there in a hurry. What happened? Well, the car was on fire. I was getting a lot of... It wasn't the engine, it was something in the front of the car, electronics or something, it was burning plastic, I was getting some fumes in there, so I just wanted to get out and get some clean air, and then I ran down here because, you know, we've got telemetry in the cars, I was hoping they saw something, maybe we could make a quick change and get out, we maybe would have only lost a lap or two. I got down here, they said it's, it's done for the day, so it's, it's disappointing because uh, you know, Shell is a big sponsor of the race here, we wanted to do a good job for them, but, you know, we'll go back to Milwaukee next week. Okay, thank you, Brian. And by the way, guys, he ran it for four laps that way. Marty? Yes, and Raul Boisel, they have refired the motor, and it looked like, I just caught a glimpse, they had bodies all over everything. It looked like they changed the spark box. He is refired, and it looks like he is going to be out and back into this race. For a moment there, this team thought that he was done for the day. Wow, what a dramatic twist. See if they can get him back out. There's Raul Boisel, Pat Patrick is his car owner. You heard Brian Herta mention they'll try to go get him next week. Next week, of course, is the Miller 200. Sunday, June 1st at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, Michael Andretti, the defending champion, where he picked up his record-breaking 32nd career win, breaking a tie with Alan Unser Jr. for second on the active list among drivers. The Miller 200, Sunday, June 1st at 2 p.m. Eastern Time on ESPN. Now, during the flurry of pit stops under this caution, there was a very, very scary moment in Jimmy Vassar's pit. Let's go back and take a look at what happened. Vassar is the car on the right. Watches his crewman pulls away the air hose that puts the car up on the jacks and then tumbles to the ground. Well, that was actually a fuel a hose fuel. there. And he, it looked like it hung for a second and he couldn't get it out. And the car started rolling and he kept trying to stretch away from it and uh, got caught with that left rear, but it looked like they uh, jumped up. We should point out, when you see those sorts of things happening, the driver is looking ahead at the man who signals him to go out of the pits. And when the car comes off the jacks, that's his signal and, to go. And he's told, go, 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 usually. And uh, they've got the medical staff down there working on him. Now off the green flag waves, we are on lap 81, and we are back underway. The leader, Dario Franchitti, just went out the bottom of your screen. There is Jimmy Vassar. He runs second, followed by Greg Moore in third. Then Alex Zanardi, Mo Gugelman, Scott Pruitt, Bobby Rahal, Parker Johnstone, Jill DeFerrin, and Al Enzer Jr. And Rahal picked up that spot on Johnstone with a quicker pit stop. And I tell you, Dario, who's a rookie, certainly made the most of that restart. He's he checked out and he's gone. He's got a big lead. Scott Pruitt goes around Mauricio Gujaman, put Pruitt up into the sixth, uh, fifth spot, and dropped Gujaman to sixth. Parker Johnstone around Bobby Ray Hall to take back the place he lost to the pit. And Jill DeFerrin up ahead. He's had a quiet race thus far. Good move there by Patrick Carpentier in the blue and white Alumax car. Went right under Al Unser Jr. diving in there to turn three. That puts Carpentier up into 10th, but here comes Unser Jr. Nope. Let me tell you, these rookies, Carpentier and Franchitti, are having a great afternoon. Franchitti leads the race. Carpentier runs back in the number 10 spot. But one airship, there's a great look at just how fast these cars go through three and four. And qualifying 197 mile an hour average through there. Now for Franchitti, this has got to be a special moment because his team owner, Carl Hogan, is actually lives and is based his operation here in St. Louis. First career lead for Dario Franchitti, and there you see him out in front. That leaves only seven drivers in today's race who have never led a lap in competition. 
Wearing the cross of St. George on his helmet, the white cross on the blue field with the flag of Italy below it. He comes from mixed Scotch-Italian parentage. And this team was late getting their act together, getting to Homestead for the first race of the season. They've done a lot of learning, getting used to the way everybody operates. He had a rough race on his first oval, first race in the PPG Cart World Series, crashing out at Homestead. And now he's running well. There's Gilles DeFerrin on the right and Patrick Carpentier on the left. Coming down from lap 83 to lap 85. Bobby Ray Hall at the bottom of the picture. There's be a lot of paper debris out there on the racetrack. Now Paul Tracy made that unscheduled pit stop that started all of this off. He had covered 79 laps on one load of fuel now that includes yellow flag laps but it's still a long excuse me 79 miles including yellow flag laps so we got a lot of mileage out of that car and he may be able to go the rest of the way on two stops we'll have to wait and see Jan Bikas yes Bob you mentioned a moment ago about paper on the racetrack the wind is blowing from the grandstands out towards the racetrack itself and many of the drivers on the radios have been talking to their crews concerned about that paper getting into the radiators so as we go later in the race, you may see some of the crews diving to the radiator openings to make sure that they're open. Flashing by the sweet tower, Jill DeFerrin started 15th, about 13 seconds behind race leader Dario Franchitti. Right down on that white line concerned about drivers getting too close to that line and the air off the car sweeping pebbles up onto the racetrack that was causing problems with tires. Well, and the safety crews worked that time to get all those pebbles out of there just in case the guy didn't get down too low. Ray Hall, DeFerrin, Carpentier and Allenser Jr. 8, 9, 10, and 11. There's the view from our Honda Helicam. I just love these wide shots. They really give you a feeling for how quickly the cars are moving relative to the scenery. Lenzer Jr. closing up a bit now on Carpentier for 10th place. Almost makes you dizzy. tough guy got out of the car and when our pit reporter went up and asked him why he said I can't hold my head up there is our race leader Dario Franchitti making his pit stop his first pit stop as the leader in a PPG Cart World Series race Marty Reed is waiting for him yes and they're a little bit out of sequence by uh, about between 15 and 20 laps depending on which car you're looking at but they are going to put four of the brand new Firestone option tires temperature track temperature now is down to 95 degrees that's really probably the coolest we've been remember qualifying yesterday was 135 great stop 13-4 the 
be up to the 60 mile an hour pit lane speed limit. And he gets to the blend line. His thumb comes off the rev limiter and away he'll go. They got to be a little careful on that pit lane because it's pretty slippery and they don't want to stand on it too hard until they're out here on the back straight, especially with cold tires. This is on lap number 97. Frankini comes back out 16. The new leader is Jimmy Vassar with Greg Moore just behind him. Where have we seen this before? There is Moore. We'll be back with more live from the Motorola 300 at Gateway International Raceway. Stay right there. We are back at Gateway International Raceway. Bobby Rahal is out of his race car, and that car is a dire emergency. That is not just a little one. That is a big fire. This is interesting. This morning we saw a couple of fires. Adrian Fernandez had one. But also interesting is that don't forget his teammate, Brian Herta, jumped out of the car because he had some kind of fire under the front end of the car uh, in some kind of an electrical problem. That's a gremlin that uh, those guys will be working on pretty uh, hard before Milwaukee. The car safety team knocked that one down in a hurry. Bobby Rahal's first DNF this year. And there is Rahal. He's got his suit down there. He might have got a little uh, singe on there. I don't know. He looked a little out of breath. Yeah, he's holding up his sleeve yeah. like he got a little burn. That's exactly the place that Max Pappas burned earlier in the weekend when he had a fire in his Toyota. Yeah, look at that's uh, Dr. Steve Olvey right there. He's saying, hey, is anything wrong there? Of course, you grabbed Max Pappas on that spot. You which keep bringing <laughs> that up. <laughs> I went up and punched him on the shoulder on a good session, and he winced, and it's because he had a big piece of skin coming off his arm as a result of that fire. Well, word to the wise, don't do that to Bobby. <laughs> <laughs> We also had a sad moment for Dan Gurney's team. As you see, Bobby Rahal, who appears to be in good shape. P.J. Jones pulled off the racetrack into the pit lane exit, so he is well out of the way. And that means that both of the All-American Racers' Toyotas are now out of the race. So we are on lap number 106. Now let's get a, an update on the weather situation. Jan Bikas. Well, we are watching the team of Ganassi Racing, and they were set up for Jimmy Vassar to make a pit stop. But now we're having some raindrops that are starting to fall here on pit lane. Not a lot of rain, but enough to where the crew decided, let's not pit right now. In case it rains, you certainly don't want to lose track position. The track is not wet, but there is a little bit of moisture that is hitting down here on pit road. All right, thank you, Jan. There you see the ambulance leaving the scene of Bobby Rahal's little conflagration. We'll have to get that car out of the way before we can go green once again. Up front, Jimmy Vassar becomes our sixth leader of the day, following Raul Boisel, Paul Tracy, Alex Zanardi, Greg Moore, Dario Franchitti. Jimmy Vassar now in there. <clears throat> With respect to Franchitti, let me correct myself for all of our friends out there from the United Kingdom. It's the cross of St. Andrews on his helmet, not St. George. I think St. George is added to St. Andrews. It gives you the crosses on the British flag. And if I haven't started a complete international incident there i may be right these views coming to us from the bud one airship which reminds you fresh beer tastes better overhead there may be raindrops on the bud one airship shortly reports of scattered rain various places around the racetrack it hasn't subdued the crowd at all a huge crowd out on the midway behind the main grandstand as well as those there 45,000 strong in that grandstand plus thousands more down on the infield Virtual sellout here on the opening day, opening event, I should say, at Gateway International Raceway. One of the things I've been impressed with is uh, Target Chip, Chip Ganassi. Those guys have been strong. They're, they're on the leaderboard. They've been running up in the top three all time. Their pit stops have been good, and they didn't qualify that well, ninth and tenth. And as I recall last year, the short ovals were the weak link in the Honda armor. Vassar is up front with Moore and Zanardi behind him. The Ganassi target boys first and third will be back in a moment. Back to racing here at Gateway. Jimmy Vassar leads. Greg Moore runs second. There's Vassar to the left of your screen, followed by the blue and white machine of Moore. Vassar rocketing away at the start. He hasn't been out there as much as he'd like this season. Uh, and I know he likes that <laughs> that spot, especially after last year's season. Coming off a championship year, he has yet to win his first race in 1997. This is the sixth round of the championship. Scott 
through it with Mario Franchitti just behind him. But Franchitti is actually 15th in the race. He runs a lap down. Boy, look at the action back there. Those guys are really bad ones. Paul Tracy trying to get around Gilles DeFerrin. Ahead of him, Al Unzer Jr. Runs just behind Parker Johnstone. Johnstone in the green and white. And Unzer Jr. And Tracy and DeFerrin wheel to wheel through three and four. That's expanding the groove. Cool. Get your heart going right there, but Paul was not going to give up that spot. Parker Johnstone wants a place from the white machine of Walter Salas, the Brazilian rookie. Andre Ribeiro, bright yellow accents on his machine. We haven't called his number much today. Unzer and Tracy nose to tail. Now Tracy looks inside his teammate way down inside he'll press the issue well Al really expanded the groove right there he helped a lot of people he knows he can work up there look at this they are look still this. wheel to wheel finally Tracy makes the pass that is tough and boy you don't want to make a mistake with your teammate out there too but look at this Al Jr. is going to come right back this is for seventh place Decides to stay low this time. Oh, that was a moment. But you know what? Al Unser Jr. is one of those guys you can race wheel to wheel with him like that. And, uh, you know you're going to have a real clean battle. He stayed right there. He didn't give up any ground. He held his line. Good look at Jill DeFerrin. Seventh. Marty Reed is down in the pit lane. Marty? Yeah, we can update you on Bobby Rahal's situation. They saw in the telemetry a bunch of temperatures going up, what shouldn't have been going up. Their best speculation right now before they see the car is that they got a crack in the wastegate, and that's what caused the fire. Jan? Marty, giving you an update on the crew member for Jimmy Vassar. His name is Kevin Edgley. He is okay. He's gone back to the garage area. He is icing down his left leg. Uh, the preliminary report is that he is not injured. Other than that, Jeff Stafford will replace him now as the left rear tire changer. All right, thank you, guys. A couple of spots of rain on that camera lens. We are at the halfway point of this race. With this lap complete, it will be official, even if the clouds open. That is not expected, but if we should get showers, we are now officially a race. Greg Morris closed up that gap. His car seems to be working better as the fuel load light. And uh, Jimmy Vassar's car seems to work very well right when they do the restart. This is only the second race this year that the defending PPG car. The grandstand, a yellow flag reportedly for moisture on the racetrack. If I'm Jimmy Vassar at this stage, <laughs> we're past the halfway point. I'm saying, please, guys, open up. Let's real. call this a race so I can go home with that victory. Cockpits of these cars are way too confining for him to get a rain dance done, but he might well do it. Up behind the pace car he comes, pace truck. Down through the gearbox. You can see the rain beginning to splatter on his onboard. Vassar, Moore, Zanardi, Pruitt, Gugelman, Johnstone, Tracy, Unzer, to Ferrin and Ribeiro, the top 10, followed by Adrian Fernandez, Patrick Carpentier, Michael Andretti having a quiet race back in 13th, Richie Hearn 14th, Dario Franchitti, the first of the lapped cars in 15th. Seems to be okay, but I think that that might be what they were looking at on that yellow too. Hey, did the track get slippery? Let's take a look. Continues to blow pretty stoutly. I would guess 20 to 25 miles an hour. And that may help keep the racetrack dry enough to race on. If the 
the sprinkles should stop. And Scott Pruitt runs in fourth place, having completed two stops, as have most of the lead cars, with the exception of Paul Tracy in seventh. Marty Reed has more on Pruitt. Yeah, this is going to get interesting down here. I don't know if they're playing a game of chicken or not, but they have got the crew out and ready for pit stop. But if they stay out and this were to become an official race in fourth right now with everybody else in front of him, Scott Pruitt would retake the points lead. Jan? Well, down here on this end, Marty, it was a game of chicken. They were set up for Jimmy Vassar and for Alex Zanardi, but they didn't come in. But we can see looking down pit road that the Penske cars have come in. So at the moment, they are down getting service, and the crew members down here for Ganassi, and we have a problem. Al Jr. is having a hard time getting away, and now it finally lights it up. And he does so just as Adrian Fernandez pulls into the pit lane. You saw Paul Tracy light up the rears in the most savage way, getting underway. Unzer was away first, but then he was slowed, and Tracy managed to get out ahead of him. Jr. follows Fernandez back out of the Tasman pits. Cars work their way up to speed on the pit exit. Now more cars pitting, including, it appears, both of the Ganassi cars. Now Greg Moore has not had two of the best stops. He's lost some ground. Here you see all three pit stops among the leaders. Jimmy Vassar is next to move, and then Zanardi. managed to get ahead on the pit lane because he was further down the lane than Moore was. Jan Bikas. Well, you may see, and you did see, three very fast pit stops there, but there is a lot of discussion going on down here with the card officials, and that is because Tom Anderson just told me the reason they did not pit originally when the pits were open is they waited until after Jimmy Vassar, Greg Moore, and Alex Zanardi were already past the pit opening before they changed the sign to green. They thought the pits were still closed. Everyone else behind was able to come into the pits. Of course, there's Billy Camphausen leaning in, trying to talk with Tom Anderson, and they're trying to get clarification. But obviously, that is going to lose them track position, and that's a tough break. But they did make a fast stop when they were here. The running order, as presently shown, Michael Andretti, Richie Hearn, Paul Tracy, Jill DeFerrin, Andre Ribeiro, Adrian Fernandez, Alan Zer Jr., Parker Johnstone, Patrick Carpentier, and Jimmy Vassar. We'll be back with more of the Motorola 300 after these messages and a word from our ABC stations. Their beautiful view from high over the all-new Gateway International Raceway in Madison, Illinois, as the Motorola 300 continues, this view courtesy of our Honda Helicam. The sprinkles appear to have stopped. We hope to get back underway very shortly. As this race is unfolded, the drivers battling for the Jim Truman Rookie of the Year Award have been a big part of our story. Cart has some extremely talented rookies running the circuit this year, and their three full-time rookies are as diverse as their homelands. Dario Franchitti has three Italian grandparents, but his accent is pure Scotland. He spent last year in touring cars with a win in six podiums. Now he's in cart, a series he came to admire without ever seeing firsthand. I've really only ever seen it on TV. I haven't been to a race before, but it just looked, the racing looked great on TV, and I thought, I really want to be a part of that. The cars look good fun to drive, and, and they are. For Walter Salas, the Rio 400 was a true home race, born and raised in Rio de Janeiro. Last year, Salas challenged for the Firestone Indy Lights Championship with three wins. Like many of Brazil's new generation, Salas came to know kart racing through the great M.O. So if there is one driver that I would like to emulate, it would be Emerson Fittipaldi for his character and his achievements out, outside the track. He's a guy that uh, I think everybody likes so because of his character and because of the good heart that he has. Patrick Carpentier is the third of the rookie triumvirate, a former speed skating champion in Canada who dominated the Toyota Atlantic Championship last year en route to the title. Now he drives for Tony Bettenhausen and admits he may have underestimated the challenge of kart. Uh, I thought it's everything I thought it would be in IndyCars, but it's even more than that. It's uh, a lot more competitive than I thought it would be. Uh, I thought I was going to arrive there and just run in top 10 and be with the fastest guys all the time. But it's very different. They are 
a very special group indeed. There you see the race leader, Michael Andretti. The first time we've seen him in that position today. He becomes, by my rough count, the seventh different leader we have had. We have 129 laps complete of 236 scheduled. We are into the second half of the race. That makes it official no matter what happens from this point forward. Mike has a quick look at his watch. Checking his watch. <laughs> Let's get down to the pit lane. Jan Bikas is standing by. Well, we've just been out jogging with Chip Ganassi. We ran all the way to the other end of pit road. You went and gave a piece of paper to Billy Camphouse and about the order you want the cars to be in. Well, what's the situation? No, what I gave, the, I gave Billy a list of the cars that pitted. We were actually past the pit entrance when they opened the pits. The cars that were behind us on the lead lap all pitted, effectively getting in front of us, and we, we, the pits were closed when we came by. So the cart's done the right thing. I want to applaud Wally and Kirk and the card organization, they did the right thing and said, wait a minute, we made a mistake, we're fixing it right now. Okay, where are they gonna put your drivers now? Where they're supposed to be. Which is? Uh, I think we're, about, well, uh, we're in front of the cars that were on our segment. We're about, I wanna say, fourth or so. We're good, they did the right thing. Okay, well, here comes Billy. He wants to give you the final report. Thank you, Chip. And happy birthday to Chip Ganassi, celebrating his 39th. We have several other birthdays this weekend. Brian Herta just turned 27 yesterday. John Delapena, Richie Hearn's car owner, turns 45 on Monday. Now, about Chip Ganassi's team situation, right now, his cars are shown third, that's Jimmy Vassar, and fifth, Alex Zanardi. Right about where Chip said he thought they should be. Right, and I think that was a smart move by Garth. They had to do it. We're under a yellow. A couple more laps not going to make any difference. Let's get them back there so that they can go racing. They've been racing up in the front all day. Good job track of these fields can be difficult, particularly when the yellow comes out, the pit action begins. We anticipate a green flag shortly, so we'll take a quick time out. You ride with Michael Andretti at the top of the heap. We'll be back to the Motorola 300 in just a moment. Don't go away. Here's Bobby Rahal, whose car caught fire earlier in the race. He is all smiles now. Let's get down to Marty Reed in the pit lane. Yeah, I don't know why he's all smiles. His right upper arm's got some nice little burns on there. Uh, you're not supposed to be doing your impersonation of Oscar Meyer. Yeah, well, uh, real shock. That's the first time for me uh, we've had something like that. Uh, the return fuel line broke. The fitting broke. You know, that's the line that return. When you get so much fuel, it gets pumped into the engine, then it returns more, you know, what it doesn't need. So it was like a fire hose basically just spewing methanol all over the car and it was lucky because it really it got hot in a big hurry and i was lucky to get it slowed down and uh jump out but it's uh it's you know not fun okay what's the doctor say about the burns first second uh second uh, second degree just sort of like a bad sunburn and uh um you know keep ice on it and don't do anything dumb and, you know it'll, it'll be fine you know i'm not worried about it at all on the milwaukee young well, Marty, checking in, of course, with Greg Moore. He was the third car involved in the cars that were late coming on the pit road. They are happy with what Card has done, as is Chip Ganassi. Now they're ready to go. They made a slight win. Well, has perfected a new exit technique on did those Did you cars. see that steering wheel? Boy, did he throw that out there, and then, of course, he hits the brakes, the wheels turn left. He wanted to get out there, which is the smartest move. Absolutely. Anticipate a green flag. The running order is Andretti, Richie Hearn, Jimmy Vassar, then Greg Moore, Alex Zanardi, and Scott Pruitt. The green flag waves. We are underway. This is lap 136. 100 laps to go, and immediately Jimmy Vassar attacks Richie Hearn. And it looks like Alex Zanardi got through. He passed Greg Moore. So the order is now Andretti, Vassar, Hearn, Zanardi, Moore. Jimmy Vassar can run him down. Mauricio Gujeman with Parker Johnstone just behind him. And then Alan, excuse me, Carl Tracy, followed by Alan Zer Jr. Four in a row. They are closing up on Scott Pruitt in six.
Casey dogging Parker Johnstone. Johnstone in the green and white machine. Tracy in the bright red and white. And Alex or Jr. taking a look right down there underneath. Those guys are racing. Marty Reed can add to this story. Check on Michael Andretti's story with Marty Reed. Okay, guys, you were talking about Michael, and you said that hey, this, this would be great news. We could get the race in. Well, that is not great news for Michael Andretti. When they did, made the decision to stay out, he asked the crew, "Start doing a rain dance, fellas, because they have to pit in about oh, lap 150, and they're out of sequence." That's 10 laps from right now. As Parker Johnstone comes under fire from Paul Tracy, Johnstone forced up high going to give little Al a run on him down the back straightaway. He's going to try to do, put him down another spot. This is a much quicker corner, a lot less braking. Parker could carry his speed. Paul Tracy quickly drawing away in the number three car. There's Johnstone, followed by Unzer. back a few car lengths. to see these drivers climb from the cars. Safety crew, of course, tremendous right there grabbing him because you, you feel like, hey, I can get out of this car. i got to get out of this car. And you don't always have your uh, feet under you the way you'd like to. We'll take another look at what happened. From the right of your screen, oh, spinning he, going in, a huge impact. Yeah, he had spun. It looked like he'd been up in that gray. He was already sideways. Luckily, he went in there with the back end first. He was running sixth at the time. Pruitt being talked to by the cart safety team at the vehicle. He's taking off his gloves there, so they're probably asking him if he knows what day it is and who the president is and who his team owner is. Massive backward impact. the other part of the safety crew quickly trying to get everything out of the way so we can get back to racing, clean up the track. Here comes an ambulance, which is a standard procedure. If you make contact with the wall, you've got to go in the ambulance to the infield uh, hospital. It's taking place on lap 145. The pits are closed. The sign comes down and the pits are open for the lead lap cars. The field has not yet reached the pit in. You ride with Michael Andretti, who has chosen not to pit yet. Let's see, he's approaching the pit entrance at the other end of this straightaway. We'll see whether the race leader comes in. Past the scene of the accident, Jan Vikas. Alinger Jr. for a moment looked like he was going to come on pit road because he felt he had run over debris. But because they have the sensors on the wheels, this tells you the actual tire pressure. They've been able to monitor that and tell Alinger Jr. that no, your tire is not going down. So the modern age of technology has saved Alinger Jr. for now a pit stop. And of course that technology is legal. It's out there 
that's available and so forth, and that's a safety issue. Michael Andretti has chosen not to pit from the lead position. Well, he has chosen not to pit yet. yet. But don't forget, they're trying to stretch that out because if they pit right now, and this goes another five, six, seven laps of, of a yellow, and he does it at the end, it gives him a bigger window at, if he pits later on. The other car staying out behind him. Now let's take another look at that accident from Scott Pruitt, Scott Pruitt's onboard camera. This is off of four. There's a Firestone Bridge. We're coming down into turn one. sideways he lost it around there I don't know if something went down or he had a little movement right before it right before he, he got sideways you saw the car move just a little bit it could have been some oil or anything he could have been a little bit up in the gray and boy when you lose it like that though you just kind of crunch down because you know this is gonna hurt and that shows you how they're on the knife edge of balance going through those corners just the slightest little input Thing he knew the back end had come around. But don't forget, at that point, he's still probably doing 155 to 165 miles an hour. In qualifying, they were doing 169 through turn one. Greg Moore went through there 175. So let me tell you, 160 miles an hour is still plenty quick. There's not that many tracks where we have an average of 160 miles an hour. Well, we'll talk this up, take this opportunity to step away for a moment. From high overhead, the Bud One Airship, providing great aerial pictures. Remember, the Bud One Airship reminds you, fresh beer tastes better. We'll be back with more live from the Motorola 300 at Gateway International Raceway. Michael Andretti out front. See if he pits before we go green. Stay with us for more from Illinois. Gateway International Raceway, the newest oval on the American racing scene. The Motorola 300 continues here on ABC Sports. In 1967, this racetrack was a simple eighth of a mile drag strip that runs right through the property where the oval track now sits. Boy, how things have changed. In 1994, Chris Poop, president and CEO of the Grand Prix Association of Long Beach, had a plan to bring racing back to the St. Louis area in the biggest possible way. Crews broke ground 11 months ago to construct the 1.27 mile oval and a quarter mile drag strip. Working against a very tight schedule, they pulled off the miracle and got this place ready to race in just 11 months. The total budget for the project was $25 million. The total capacity in the main grandstand, 45,000, with room for expansion to 80,000 fans. A remarkable achievement in public and private cooperation and a fabulous facility, including 30 luxury suites with an amazing view. The front straightaway and turns one and two. Right now, the track is occupied by the pride of the PPG Kart World Series. Round six, the Motorola 300. Michael Andretti is the leader, and the drivers have had nothing but good things to say about this racetrack, Danny. Well, they have. I think it reminds a lot of them of Phoenix, uh, except without that little dog leg in the back. And uh, I know that uh, almost every driver really enjoyed going to Phoenix. In fact, that shot right there almost looks like Phoenix with that building down there. And, uh, you know, it's a... It's just a uh, fabulous facility, very fast. Uh, they said it was very physical. Uh, everybody enjoyed it. I think they feel well about the safety facilities of it. The pits were nice. All in all, a great addition to the racing scene here in Mid-America. Down to Jan Bikas in the pits. While you're talking about track construction, look at the size of the pit boxes here. They are 50 feet long. That is the largest pit box they've ever had in kart competition. The next largest is 39 feet down at Homestead. Now, we're down here with Greg Moore and the players' foresight team. It's raining just a little bit. Now it's starting to clear up. What are they talking about on the radio? They, re they radio to Greg Moore. Greg, can we do anything for you? He says, well, you know, I'm bored. I want to go fast. Now, a little bit of trivia before we go down to Marty Reed, and that is why does Greg Moore have the preferred pit position when right next door is Roger Penske when they out-qualified them at the previous race? Well, if you have two cars, they qualified fifth and ninth, Greg Moore qualified eighth. It's not the actual qualifying position. They have to average the time that Penske did, which turned out to be just a tick slower than Greg Moore. They got the preferred spot. Let's go down to Marty Reed. 
Yeah, and Danny, you were talking about pilots and who, all the contact and the uh, weather report. Well, let's find out from Paul. Have you called your pilot? Well, they always say luck is an art, but we've got about four planes up there seeding the clouds right now. <laughs> all right. I've, I've been trying. I mean, everybody is like hush hush in your camp. How far can you guys go before you have to stop? Far. <laughs> I'll tell you what, uh, this is like pulling teeth down here today, guys, I'm telling you. Well, everybody's got their own strategy and we're entitled to ours. Yeah, you know, I, I keep saying DSS is the curse of our job down here because everybody's washing the dish and as soon as they see somebody from another team come on, it's like, turn up the volume, we gotta find out what's going on. And you guys have done a real good job so far, staying hush-hush. Yeah, well, we'll see. It's in the hands of the gods. And your four pilots. Yes, and the pilots are in Michael, of course. All right, thank you, gentlemen. We have 72 laps remaining. Now, keep in mind, earlier in the race, Paul Tracy went 64 laps on a load of fuel. So we're getting very, very close to that window. From our position high above the front straightaway, the rain sprinkles have not completely stopped. So things are going to get interesting here as we get closer and closer to that fuel window. But don't forget, they also have to calculate those yellow laps and the green laps during that 64-lap run. So these guys are constantly doing the math, trying to figure out if it goes green again, how long can they go in that condition? Because they are burning fuel right now, of course. And if you were with us for our most recent race, the Rio 400, Bobby Rahal's team can tell you just how close those calculations can come and just how much is stake when you roll the dice on fuel and either get it right or get it wrong. Gateway arches across the mighty Mississippi. We'll be back in just a moment. Way International Raceway. The field lines up behind Michael Andretti. No word yet on when we will attempt a green flag. Let's get down to Jan Bikas. Well, Bob, sometimes when you have raindrops, it gives us a chance to take an inside look at what happens here on pit road. You can see a few raindrops, but you also see tools that are taped to this front wing for Adrian Fernandez. You can see the actual bolts for the nose are taped here, and those tools that are taped to the front of the wing are obviously to change it. Now, if you were to damage the rear wing, here is the exact tool that you need to do one side, and here is the wrench for the other. So it's taped to the bottom side of the wing. You can see the bolts and the nuts were there as well. So the Tasman crew is ready for something they hope they never have to use, but it does help in case you need it. Let's go to Marty Reed. All right, we're standing with Bruce McCall, his man right now. Mo Guzman is running in fifth. You've had the bitter and the sweet so far. The bitter, of course, earlier when Mark Blundell went out, and I know there was a lot of pressure with it being the Motorola 300 and his car being a Motorola car. Well, that's right. We were really disappointed. Mark went out early. He was he, he started quite a ways back, but he had a really good race car. He was running well. He was he was moving right through the field. So we're very disappointed for all the Motorola folks, but we're thrilled to see the crowd out here today. A great run. Mauricio's running well, and uh, we're hoping we'll go green here in a few minutes and uh, run to the finish. We, we've got a good car with Mauricio, and we're, uh, we're very excited about it. And you're not going to tell me when you're going to have to pit either, are you? Not a chance. Boy, nobody likes me today. I'll tell you what, come on over here real quick, because I just happened to see the man I've wanted to talk to, and this is a good sight, Scott Pruitt. Uh, I'm glad to see you standing and being able to talk to me because that was one wicked crash. That was a that was a big hit. I think that says a lot about CART and, and their safety and, you know, how they really work on the cars. And it's unfortunate for us. I mean, the Brahma guys are doing a great job. Our pit stops are right on real quick. We were fighting a brake pedal in traffic. It just kept kept going down and going down and going down. And I was pumping it and pumping it. And just got in there and went for the brake pedal and just went right to the floor. And I thought I might be able to make it around, but just got down in there and just popped out from underneath me. Yeah, I thought for a second something broke because it stepped right out on you. No, I just, you know, just going in there, typically just get on the brakes a little bit and get the car woed and then get down at the bottom and try to do that and it just, just came around on me. And I was just going, whoa, 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 you know, and just slipped out and took a shot. That was a big shot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was. Hey, this, the safety, though, of these cars, we've talked about it before. Let's talk about it again. That Sometimes you don't walk away from those in, in other forms of racing. This one, you did. It says a lot. I don't know how, I mean, how many G's we pulled, but it was a lot. And, and now with this weather, it's, it's really unfortunate. I mean, if we were just going to hang in there for a little bit. And, and we'll keep at it in the points race and points championship. And hopefully we can uh, come back in Milwaukee. Well, as I said, it's great to talk to you. We'll see you in Milwaukee. Thank you. Jan? Well, Marty, something you can do in the rain, obviously, is play football. But you can't go and drive race cars in the rain. Joe Montana, obviously involved with uh, Target Team Ganassi, 
You guys right now are running second and third. We know that Michael needs fuel. Uh, obviously, you got to be pretty excited considering that qualifying didn't go too well. Well, definitely. Uh, we're, we're excited to be in this position. We like to get the race going because we've uh, actually been outrunning Michael most of the time. So it'd be an interesting because Michael gets stuff when he's in the lead. So I like to see the guys at least finish it out there on the track, whether we win it or lose it. Everybody that way, we can answer a lot of questions. Our guys at least have a shot at it. Now, what is your role here? You have a headset on. You're up in the timing stand. What is your active role during the race? I'm a spectator. <laughs> I'm just having fun with it. And I'm just still learning, you know, so it's, it's just been a lot of fun and listening to what they're doing and talking about and the decisions made. And, uh, but basically, I just, I leave all that up to Chip. I mean, he's the expert, not me. Those guys are getting paid for what they do, and I'm just, just here enjoying it. Now, what is your attraction to auto racing? Obviously, we've we've heard that you enjoy that, but what is it about racing that, that's got a grip on you? Well, I think it's anything that every little boy's dream, you know, is to get in a car and go fast. And then this is the ultimate when you look at cars that go fast, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, it's almost like a, an airplane flying upside down but being pushed into the ground instead. And the things these guys go through and, and to watch the, uh, the interaction on the racetrack, Nah, it gets you go it just gets you going and, and when your cars I was just telling the guys that it's nothing better than seeing our guys right next to each other especially up in the front all right Joe Montana you heard it from him but you know he said he doesn't do much but I think the team thinks he's a good luck charm let's go to Marty Reed well I'm looking at Barry Green's face and, and and a seventh place run with all the misfortune this team's had I would think you'd have a smile on your face which may lead me to believe do you have a problem Oh, no, we don't have a problem, Marty. Uh, in fact, the car is really good right now. Uh, we were a little off pace at the start of the race, but uh, made a couple of adjustments in the pit stops, and uh, Parker's really pleased with the car right now. A little frustrated. You know, we keep looking up. We think it's going to get brighter, and it does, and it starts to, to uh, rain a little bit again. But uh, now we'd like to go back racing because uh, we think there's a couple of guys up front of us that uh, are going to have to make some different moves on what we're going to do, and uh, we would like to get it back and go, go the full distance. Guys, I'm telling you, I'm not even going to ask when he's going to stop because I'm tired of being told nobody's going to tell me. I'll tell you one, one thing, though. It, it, as far as the, the pace of this race, has he said anything about the fatigue factor? Because Parker's one of the guys that's most physically fit out here. Well, uh, he was working hard in the early part of the race, but that was mainly because of the car. And, uh, you know, we've got the balance back, and he's a lot more comfortable now. But there's, uh, there's a lot of guys uh, around him that are plenty fast, too, and they're pretty keen to win the race. Uh, no, we haven't talked much about that. He is fit. Um, it's pretty easy under these conditions. We want to go back to green. So do we. Bob? All right, thanks, guys. 64 laps to go. Keep in mind, Paul Tracy did 64 laps on a load of fuel earlier in the race. So we are entering the window. The final pit stops can be made and be assured of going the rest of the way. The guys that are working the hardest at the moment are the guys calculating the fuel stops. And, and that changes every lap that they go under yellow. There you see Jimmy Vassar. He has led 24 laps. His teammate has led six. That makes a total of 30 laps for Target Team Ganassi. And that's 30 laps worth of $25 donations to the Target House at St. Jude's Children's Hospital just down the Mississippi in Memphis, Tennessee. If Jimmy or Alex can come through and win the race, Ganassi Racing will write a check for $5,000 toward the Target House. While the raindrops continue to sprinkle in the with more from Gateway International Raceway. Andre. Green flag, let's get down to the pit lane and Jan Bikas. Tom Anderson is the managing director for Target Team Ganassi. Now, Tom, you guys were just flipping a coin. You and Chip Ganassi flipped a coin. Obviously, that was a decision as to whether to pit or not. What did you decide? Well, we decided that he won the toss and it's his decision, so I'm waiting for his instruction. Now, what is it that you're trying to balance here? It looks like the rain has stopped, could go green any time, but now is your pit window open? Oh, yeah, the pit window's open right now. I mean, you could go from here to the end. So it just depends on uh, how the rain goes and what the yellow happens from here. But uh, we just didn't both want to make the same mistake. Now, you're talking about splitting the cars. Does that mean you might pit one car and not the other so you have your bases covered? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, has that decision been made? No. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Thanks. Marty? Okay, I'm down here with Derek Walker. And Derek's uh, on the radio to his man, uh, Gilles DeFerrin. Uh looks like where we're at if we could go racing but you say conversation with Jill it's different out there well it's changing as we speak uh, a couple of minutes ago it was pretty uh, heavy over in turn three and four 
No, uh, it looks like it's looking a lot better, and I think Kyle's going to try and get it underway here in about two or three laps. And you're saying your car's finally starting to come in? Uh, well, no, it really depends. Um, I'd say about 93, or 93 is, uh, is roughly about where the window might be. So we finally got somebody, guys, to tell us what lap they may be coming in on here. Uh, running in ninth place, Gilda Perrin. All right, thank you, guys. How about that chain of command down there at Team Ganassi? <laughs> yeah, flip the coin. How many sides do you think were on that coin? <laughs> <laughs> There's a two-headed coin. Down on the racetrack, Michael Andretti is up front. And Derek Walker, of course, gave us an answer, but that doesn't mean that that's what they're going to actually do because a lot of it will just keep being recalculated with this yellow situation. Jan and Marty are going to be so persistent. Pretty soon guys will fight just to get them out of their faces. It is Andretti, Vassar, Zanardi, Greg Moore, who has been quick all day, Mauricio Gujelman. One other factor in here is this puts a lot of a lot of pressure on the drivers because they know it adds something to it. They Most of them are going to have to fill up one more time, but they've got to make something happen because one, the rain is out there, and two, they're getting close to the end of the race. Now shortly the revs will start to build. Word is we will get the green flag in two laps. Jan Bikas. Well, check out these little radios. Of course, you see big radios up and down pit road that both the teams and the drivers use. Of course, Motorola is a sponsor here, and they have just introduced some new radios. They're called the Talkabout. And what the idea is that you take them out with your family, you go skiing or whatever, you give them to your kids, or at home if you're trying to find somebody. You don't need a license. Uh, it has a, a new frequency. I guess it's called the Family Band. So this gives us an opportunity. You obviously have a new sponsor here. They have some new products. And, you know, this is also an idea for fans in the stand to be able to talk to each other at the same time that they listen to the scanner during the race. So another added bonus for the race fan. Battery's not included, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll go through some, I'm sure. And he gave he gave one flag to go. See some, uh-oh, there's one of the cars uh, has been in the pits. That's Zanardi. He's leaving. He obviously tapped topped up with that fuel and he's going to try to run green all the way till the end so that takes him out of third place moves greg moore up to that spot so already moves back out to take his place in the line The revs come up. Michael Andretti to the left of your screen. Jimmy Vassar behind him. Greg Moore in blue and white. They are off the corner. The signal from the spotters. Green flag. And immediately, Paul Tracy is on the move. He dives underneath Mauricio Gugelin for fourth. There is Tracy. Absolutely flying. He has won the last two races of the series, and he has definitely got something cooking here as his teammate Alenzer Jr. heads for the Penske pits. Look at Paul Tracy. There is Alan there looking in the back of the car. That is not good news. The belts come off, and Alenzer Jr. will climb out. Taking his head restraint. What a disappointment for Al Jr. 27 years after his dad won the last race for championship cars here in Illinois. Is finished. Meanwhile, Paul Tracy tries to close the gap on the red machine of Jimmy Vassar. And look at him close up. He is really hooked up at the moment. Look back from Vassar to Tracy.
Vikas has caught up with Al Ezu Jr. Al, what happened to your car? Ah, uh, well, finally knocked me out. There was a gearbox busted. He said, finally. What was the problems you were having earlier? He said, finally. What were the problems you had earlier? Well, at the beginning of the race there, I had a wicker build that was starting to come out. That's why I came in that one pit stop. And then, uh, I guess, I'm supposed to go back to the back of the pack, which I didn't realize. And so when we started again, then they told me I had to go back to the back of the pack, so I went to the back. We're going to way up through there. Uh, but that all kind of worked itself out because they kind of made some bad calls up in cart. And, uh, and then finally what knocked me out was the gearbox. Okay, obviously Alan Sue Jr. not happy with the call upstairs. Three guys happy, but obviously those who are moved back are not, Bob. Thank you, Jan. Meanwhile, Michael Andretti's lead is shrinking. Jimmy Vassar, Paul Tracy, Greg Moore all closing. Tracy now looking inside Vassar. Oh, the series champion will not let him in. That was close. And, and look at that. He got up there high. So Greg Jimmy Vassar goes underneath Andretti for the race lead. And Tracy and Moore come up quickly. Does Michael have a problem? Or did he just lose momentum in three and four? He drops back to fourth place in the space of a half lap. He's losing a lot of ground. Uh, uh, Big Moe's right behind him. I don't know what happened to him there. He's still trying to hang in there, but he looked like he lost a tremendous amount of momentum. He's going down there. I'd say Michael's got a problem. Seem to listen to Michael's car. It appears to be wrong outwardly. Now Andretti is back in fifth spot, and Parker Johnstone is next to take a shot at him. Marty Reed, what can you tell us about Michael? me that nothing's wrong with the car right now they are playing with the fuel mixture trying to get as much as mileage as they can out of this thing but they're saying there's no real problem with the race car i don't know if maybe the handling's starting to go away because of the changing track conditions well either that or everybody else has got their fuel mixture turned up and they're burning you know closer to 100 percent so they got more horsepower and just uh, stronger down the straightaway Andretti leads Johnstone. Andre Ribeiro is now up in the middle of that fight. And Johnstone goes underneath Andretti to take away fifth place. Meanwhile, the leaders in traffic. Jimmy Vassar at the bottom of your screen. Out from behind the white machine of Walter Salas comes Paul Tracy and Greg Moore right there. And as we've seen all day long, look how high Greg Moore goes off of that turn two. But as we've seen all day long, he seems to take a couple laps to get that thing settled in. And then he seems to run stronger as he gets further into his run. Of course, as we predicted at the beginning of the show, traffic plays an important part here. Look at the numbers on the gap between Tracy and Moore in the battle for second place and the way it's fluctuated over the last three laps. Came right down to five one hundredths of a second. Tracy on the left, Moore on the right, running second and third. Further behind this group, Mauricio Gujami, there's Walter Salas in the white car, Michelle Jourdain, they're both several laps down. It's Andre Ribeiro, just behind Ribeiro is Dario Franchitti. Oh, and something flew off Franchitti's car. I think that was just something that was on the track. Was anybody a problem, but of course the, the, the yellow will come out. They don't know that until they go out and pick it up. So Franchitti now loses a bolster. Looks like it might be the one to the left of the driver. Driver's left, that is. We are under a yellow. Pits are closed. Jimmy Vassar leads Paul Tracy. This action taking place as we come around to complete lap 197. So the all-important round of final 
last stops coming up. Now, the hardest part is, of course, what has everybody done before, including Paul Tracy? Does he have enough fuel? I mean, after that yellow, or is he going to have to get a splash? Are they going to take a chance and hope for another yellow with just 39 laps to go? Can you stay out? We saw Alex Zanardi come in for a splash before we went green. He went to the back of the lead lap cars. Now, is that going to, with this round of pit stops, move him to the front? Into the pits they come. Pits are now open, and everybody heading this way. Jimmy Vassar in red. Red and white machine of Paul Tracy. The blue and white machine of Greg Moore. While well, the lapped cars stay on the racetrack. To Jan Vikas. Jimmy Vassar is here, and he's only getting fuel at the moment. They are not going to put tires on his car. 8.22 seconds. A very quick stop. Here comes Greg Moore. Greg Moore got out ahead of Paul Tracy, but behind Jimmy Vassar. But remember, uh, Paul Tracy got tires. The other two guys just took on fuel. Marty Reed. Yes, and if you look at uh, Michael Andretti, they put two full turns out of the front wing. That means that's why he was falling back. And Andretti comes back out. Dario Franchitti moves into the lead under yellow. With plenty of laps still to come. We'll step away and be back for more live from Gateway International Raceway in just a moment. Back to the Motorola 300. We are back under green flag conditions. Dario Franchitti leads the race over Patrick Carpentier in a battle of the series rookies. There is Franchitti. Down to Marty Reed. Hey, Dario Franchitti, I'm down here. We may have another Rio brewing here, guys. These guys are going to roll the dice. They are going to go for it. They are short right now. They need one more yellow. Jan. Just news from the Players Foresight team. Greg Moore has a tire coming down. He's coming onto pit road as we speak. They came in here a moment ago, and all they did was take fuel. But now a tire is going down, and I don't hear the engine running. For some reason, he has no fire. Here comes the electric starter. Boy, Greg Moore has got to be dying right now, losing all his positions on the track. Greg Moore was looking so good up until this point. Greg Moore drops all the way back to 14th place. He's not on track yet either. That's right. As the field comes down the start finish straight away. He is a lap down on the racetrack during that rush of pit stops. Here's Paul Tracy going underneath Jimmy Vassar. Give Tracy fifth. He drops Vassar to sixth. Don't forget he's got a full load, but he's got fresh tires on there too. Over the bump, out of four. Flashing under the flag stand at 175 miles an hour. Not taking a gear. He turns one and two as his teammate Alex Zanardi was earlier in the race. Zanardi runs three places ahead of his teammate. Greg Moore back. Obviously, Paul Tracy very happy right now. Well, the Baron able to hold the gap just a bit now on Tracy. And the leader is slowing. Dario Franchitti. That can't be fuel because they wouldn't have taken a gamble. That's, that's way too short. Something's gone wrong there. 26 laps to go. What a disappointment for the home team from Hogan Racing. Everybody looking as he goes by to make sure there's no liquids dropping out of that car. He'll probably go to the end of the pits and take a, a left turn right on your screen. Marty Reed, what can you add? The word we're hearing on the radio is it's a probable gearbox problem. So there goes our Rio finish, guys. Well, now surging to the front, the guy Frankiti is battling for the rookie championship, Patrick Carpentier, driving for Tony Bettenhausen. And what's interesting is we've seen some gearbox problems here. Of course, they shift here, which they normally don't do on most oval. So maybe it's a just behind him. They are now battling over third place. Saw statistics on the top 20 cars. Patrick Carpentier, our eighth leader of the day, and like Frank Keaty before him, this is the first time. 
behind him. They are now battling over third place. Saw statistics on the pit stops for the leading cars. Patrick Carpentier, our eighth leader of the day, like Frank before him, his first time ever in the lead in a PPG Carp World race. Running further back in the pack, Andre Ribeiro runs in G-forces, Bob, and we've also seen some gearbox failures. Remember that the gearbox is a stressed member of these cars. It is true that they do some shifting, so it may be possible, it's just speculation on my part, that when they're pulling almost five Gs in the corners, that might be putting the extra stress on the actual drivetrain. Got a dramatic finish coming. We'll take a break and return. Stand by for more of the Motorola 300. Patrick Carpentier leads that man. Alex Zanardi with Paul. Gilles DePerrin came right back, nearly started. Stop my heart. Now, is Patrick Carpentier okay? I keep the recalculations going time and time again. You can see him. They're not quite sure yet if they're going to make this. The guy who might be sitting in the catbird seat, just like he might have been also had Paul Tracy run into trouble back at Rio, is Alex Zanardi. Maybe Team Ganassi may be the ones to benefit if these guys fall a little bit short. And also, one thing helping Patrick Carpentier right now is Paul Tracy being all over Alex Zanardi. to use as much fuel as the Penske chassis for Paul Tracy. Let's get up to you guys, because I guess we have a battle on the racetrack. Oh, do we ever, as Paul Tracy stuck it underneath Alex Zanardi and back to the streets of Surfers Paradise Australia when those two guys went wheel to wheel and it hurt both of them. Tracy tangled, knocked out of the race. Zanardi tangled, managed to get going again, charged to fourth. But what a disappointment for both of them. Now here they are, nose to tail at 190 miles an hour at Gateway. that Patrick Carpentier may not go the distance. He's got to get his drive up there in front. And Paul Tracy knows that as well. So we've got uh, and five Al's telling him to, you know, think points and stay sharp. At the beginning of our program, our theme was the traditions of Memorial Day. And what could be a more important tradition than oval racing with a name like Bettenhausen? It's been a long haul for Tony Bettenhausen and his team. They have come upon a diamond in the rough. Patrick Carpentier, if he can hold on for five laps of this one and a quarter mile racetrack to bring Tony to victory lane. And here comes Paul Tracy. He took a run through three and four. He's got him. Tracy He's got him. Into second place. But does Tracy have enough time to close on Carpentier? You ride with Alex Zanardi. Four to go. Marty Reed. The, they're telling him he's got to run. Patrick Carpentier, 26 second laps, and he's Three races in a row, now he has done the same. Let's get down to victory lane. There is Paul Tracy. Paul Tracy, that was an awesome race for you. Tell me, in the middle of the race, did you still think you had a shot to win this one? Well, when we stayed out on that first stop and it put us on, I thought uh, it was going to be a long day, and the car was handling good. We uh, were a little loose at the beginning, but the Marlboro car, we made some adjustments on this first stop, and the thing came to, and we worked our way back to the front, and, I don't know what was going on with the timing and scoring, but I got put back a bunch of positions, and uh, hey, I thought it was going to end. You know, I thought we were going to get stuck in eighth place and, with the rain, and uh, hey, the car was great. The guys did great on the, on the pit stops, and Mercedes, we got the fuel mileage we needed so we could run full rich at the end, and, uh, and we just chased them down. Okay, thank you, Paul. Congratulations, three in a row. Let's go to Marty Reed. Well, from the best of ninth place, Miami, second place, congratulations. You almost pulled it off. We really did. We uh, we had a strategy there right before the end of the race. We we wanted to pit and top it off with fuel before all of the, the cars in front of us did. And uh, as it turned out, we needed about the balance of fuel. We had to back him down at the end. Not make an excuse. Paul Tracy drove a hell of a race, but, uh, you know, we could have sure used a couple more gallons. <laughs> Second place. They're still happy, guys. A good job for Tony Bettenhausen and his team. The one-third mark of the 1997 PPG Cart World Series. The leader is Paul Tracy, 